All right, uh, so it's 8 p.m. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, to this event on uh, No Cold War, opposing the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act and the U.S. Escalation on China. Uh, There's a pa uh, panel uh, where our speakers will be talking about uh, the recent aggressive actions by the United States against the country and the need for the left to oppose it. Uh, so I want to remind everyone again that uh, this session will be recorded uh, and will be presented uh, on YouTube for uh, viewing either later or for people who uh, cannot, uh, who couldn't attend the event tonight. I also want to remind everyone that uh, we will have a Q&A session later on. So if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat. So. Let's have an overview of uh, today's agenda. All right, so in terms of uh, today's agenda, we are going to have a few speakers. Uh, we'll have uh, Vijay Prashad, Things Shock, and Richard Wolf. Uh, following that, we'll have a review of the US Innovation and Competition Act uh, by an international committee member, followed by panelists Q&A. Uh, and finally, we'll conclude it with some calls to action and some closing remarks. All right. Okay, so I will introduce the our first speaker uh, of this evening, uh, Mr. Vijay Prashad. Uh, Mr. Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian and journalist. He's the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief correspondent for Globetrotter and chief editor of Left Road Books. Uh, he is also um, he has also published thirty books, including most recently Washington Bullets, with the preface by uh, former Bolivian President Evo Morales, and previously the two-volume history of the modern world, the darker nations, a people's history of the third world, and the poorer nations, a possible history of the global south. He is the recipient of the two thousand nine Muzaffar Ahmad Memorial Prize. Uh, Mr. Prashad, uh, take it away. Okay, well, uh, you know, it's really good to be with you. And um, I want to applaud the uh, DSA International Committee for holding a webinar, uh, which is going to look at, I think, what is the most pressing fault line uh, on the world today. And that is the escalating um, rhetoric and, and military buildup by the United States and its allies against um, the People's Republic of China. And in a sense, as I'm going to suggest, against Asia. I think we're in a very difficult position now, and I'm, I'm really happy that the DSA International Committee, and I hope the whole DSA, is seized of the importance and centrality of this particular fault line. Look, um, today is, and let me just quickly check the date because I forgot. Today is the 20th of September, and I saw images coming from Del Rio, the border between the United States and Mexico, where border patrol officers and so-called deputized, I don't know what they are, vigilante groups, went out there and beat Haitians Haitians who fled, you know, not only the impact of U.S. imperialism against Haiti since 1804, but who in particular fled after this earthquake. You know, it's just horrendous what one sees. The kind of limited criticism coming from the White House of that behavior on the border. You know, we don't know the context. We don't know the context. What context do you need to know when you see a man on a horse whipping a Haitian who's trying to flee? who's trying to survive, who's trying to live. This is the attitude. Um, that photograph showed me the attitude of the United States government vis-a-vis -vis the world, friends. So I'm really happy and I want to salute the DSA International Committee uh, for, for taking the issue of US imperialism so seriously, not only with regard to China, but also the kind of ridiculously um, inhumane pressure campaign against Cuba. So congratulations for that. In my 15 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about why the United States has escalated this pressure campaign against uh, China. And I'm not going to talk much about the economics of it, the political economy of it. I'm sure Richard will have things to say about that. I'm just going to give you, in a sense, the historical context of when this pressure campaign begins and what I think is leading to this pressure campaign. And, and really, literally, this really quite... Um, 
what I think of as dangerous situation that these, these sequential administrations of Obama, Trump and Biden have put uh, the world in. Uh, this is a very dangerous situation and I want to kind of put it into context. The first thing to recall is that the United States has an international base structure to support what is without argument the largest military on the planet and the most dangerous military on the planet. No other country has escalated into so many wars, direct wars, let alone hybrid wars, sanctions and so on. 30 countries under US unilateral sanctions, set that aside. Direct wars, you're all of course uh, now seized and gripped by what has happened in Afghanistan. There was the illegal war in Iraq, of course the war on Libya and so on and so forth. The wars that are being conducted in subterfuge in Africa. I was um, at the Agadez base in Niger and I tell you it's the largest drone base on the planet and nobody in the United States knows about it. The US government has a set of bases in the Sahel region almost without comment in the United States press with so little understanding that when some US servicemen were killed in Niger the House or the Senate Armed Services Committee had a hearing where the chair of the committee said, I didn't know we had troops in Niger. You have the world's biggest drone base in Agadez, Niger, and you, perhaps you're lying to the American people or whatever, but you, the chair of that committee said, I didn't know we had US troops in Niger. That's the state of civilian oversight of the military. They just forget where they have troops. You know, They can't keep up with the escalation of US uh, forces and force projection around the planet. Well, in 2009, there was a democratic election in Japan where Premier Hatoyama uh, won the election based with a huge mandate against the base in Okinawa. He comes to power, Hatoyama comes from a long lineage of Japanese politicians, he's a mainstream liberal, comes to power in Tokyo, has a government and they start the proceedings of whether they can disentangle the US base structure in Okinawa. Obama goes there and shuns him at a meeting. Uh, Hillary Clinton goes to Tokyo and his government falls. You know, it's a coup d'etat nobody talks about. That's the necessity of this base structure and of the enormous military projection that the United States government has. This was, my friends, in 2009, long before there was talk about so-called Russian interference in U.S. elections. Just another instance of U.S. interfering, not in Honduras, where there was a coup also in 2009 against Zelaya, but against a G7 partner country, a G7 partner country, one of the so-called high countries in the world, you know, which sits at the big boys table. The United States conducts what was effectively a coup against Japan because they could not allow the base structure, including the important base in Okinawa to be dismantled. I just want you to get a sense of how power is projected, friends. It's not a, it's not a nice thing. They don't just go there and talk about human rights and so on. This is effectively international bullying and it undermined the mandate offered to the Hatoyama government um, by the Japanese people. Since then, Japan has just had right wing governments, you know, before Hatoyama and after Hatoyama. You got Shinzo Abe back. Abe was there before Hatoyama and now you got Suga. You'll have another election and I bet you it'll be a right wing, maybe even further right wing figure in Japan. They had an opportunity in 2009 and the Obama administration took it away from them. The reason Okinawa is so important is the United States has felt the need to put a squeeze on Eurasia. Uh, two years after the overthrow of Hatoyama from Japan, Henry Kissinger published a book called On China, a very significant book. Kissinger had never really written a full length study of his understanding of Eurasia and China. This was the first study. It's an enormous book. I mean, it's like most of his books. He made a pretty interesting uh, assessment of the situation in, in, in Eurasia. What Kissinger said is a long-standing um, you know, uh, uh, issue in US foreign policy. Kissinger said there are two major powers on the Eurasian continent, China and Russia. And the way the United States has to dominate Eurasia is that you have to befriend one of the powers against the other. 
And for a long time, um, the United States had tried to befriend the Chinese, which is why Kissinger, uh, when he was working with uh, Nixon as the national security advisor, went to Pakistan, goes to China and so-called, uh, you know, sets the stage for Nixon to arrive in China, deepen the Sino-Soviet dispute and so on. Um, they put their eggs essentially in the crate of the Chinese in the 1970s. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, the Clinton administration reversed this and went full speed ahead, uh, believing that Yeltsin and the people that followed, the kind of cronies in Russia, would become a necessary subordinate ally of the United States in Eurasia. A lot of eggs were put in the Russian basket, but there was a feeling that both China and Russia would become US allies. Um, that wasn't working out so well, and I'm going to jump because I only have 15 minutes. I'm going to jump forward. Kissinger in 2011 urged the United States to, to avoid Russia. He said Russia is an unreliable ally. The United States needs to deepen its links with China and China is going to become the necessary pillar just as Israel is in the Middle East or Colombia is in, in Latin America. China will be the necessary pillar in Eurasia to balance the world and allow the United States to maintain um, its dominance for another century. It's an extraordinary argument. Of course, that was written in 2011. Um, not long after, in November 2011, Hillary Clinton published an article in Foreign Affairs magazine called America's Pacific Century, where she began to rehearse many of the themes that have been with us for the past decade. For instance, how to box China in. This was a major thing. How to box China in. She talked about so-called freedom of navigation maneuvers. That's when U.S. military armed ships will go and skirt Chinese territorial waters. How Hong Kong, Taiwan will be used as wedges essentially to provoke the Chinese and so on. This was what Hillary Clinton wrote in 2011 November after Kissinger's book had come out. The feeling was from people who watch foreign policy closely that this would mean that the US was going to pick Russia, make a closer entente with Putin against uh, China. But of course, the Obama administration went in the other direction, which was provoked both countries. And this is what really happened after that. In 2011, Hillary Clinton, in fact, pushing forward the idea that you befriend Russia and marginalize China in, in Madras in 2011, gave a speech where she talked about the new Silk Road. This new Silk Road was going to go from India through Pakistan, through Afghanistan, into Central Asia, and then into Russia. It was going to be a way for the United States to have a direct contact with the Russians, Russian market and basically uh, have this vertical axis uh, marginalizing the Chinese. This is in 2011. 2013, as you know, Xi Jinping talks for the first time about One Belt, One Road, which eventually becomes the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the game is on. I mean, the United States starts directly in 2011 with its so-called pivot to Asia and the pressure campaign against the Chinese. Uh, this begins in the Obama period. But at the same time, the United States is pressing, pressing the Russians. Look at the two amazing things that happen. Um, the Russians have only two major warm water ports. One is in Sevastopol in the Crimea, and the second is in Tartus in Syria. Within the course of 18 months, the United States basically provoked the Russians to intervene militarily in both places. Um, in 2014, the Russians intervened into the Crimea to defend their port in Sevastopol. By the way, in 2016, Obama gave an interview in the Atlantic to Jeffrey Goldberg, where he said, you know, we shouldn't provoke the Russians. They have, uh, uh, you know, they have a, a, an interest uh, because it's their sphere of influence in Ukraine and so on. But they'd already provoked them. And the intervention happened in 2014. Obama was a sophisticated guy. I mean, he said um, to Gold Goldberg, he said, basically, the policy of foreign policy is don't do stupid shit. But listen to the stupid shit they did. That's, by, by the way, an Obama quote. That's what he understood to be the Obama doctrine. They essentially drew the Russians into Sevastopol, into Crimea to defend that port. At the same time, in September 2015, just within 18 months, the Russians intervened in Syria. Russian uh, Air Force enters Damascus airport. Russian ships enter Tartus, Latakia to defend their port there. So they poked the bear again, uh, Obama. Don't do stupid shit. They poked the bear. The Russians are very aggressive defending their two ports. 
Meanwhile, on the other side, the United States goes nuts against China, you know, intensifying this whole pressure campaign through initially uh, talking about the Quad. The idea of the Quad, quadrilateral security arrangement, is actually something mooted by Shinzo Abe, the right wing, far right wing premier in Japan, in a speech he gives in New Delhi at the parliament uh, in 2007, doesn't go anywhere. It's revived by the United States. They create a platform with India, Japan, and Australia, military alliance, which is essentially against China. In 2017, 2018, they changed the Pacific Command into Indo-Pacific Command. They heavily uh, ramp up funding for the Indo-Pacific Command. At that time, Admiral Philip Davidson gave a series of provocative speeches talking about how they would use battlefield nukes to put the Chinese in their place and so on. Battlefield nukes to put the Chinese in their place. This is a US admiral, okay? This was literally, it was like a rerun of Dr. Strangelove. I mean, th these are supposed to be serious people. It's really hard to take them seriously. They're very dangerous people. So that was happening then in the Obama administration and early Trump. Things have gotten infinitely worse since then. Just last week, the United States, Australia, and the UK created a new alliance called AUKUS, one of the stupidest names for a military alliance, AUKUS. Um, what's interesting about AUKUS is it's created all kinds of um, internal fissures in the G7 alliance, because in order to put AUKUS through, the United States, UK, and Australia had to kick out an arms deal signed in 2016 between France and Australia to the tune of $90 billion to provide Australia um, with 12 to 16 diesel-powered nuclear submarines. Now the British, that is BAE Systems, and the US, that's you know uh, General Dynamics and New, uh, Newport uh, Shipbuilding Yard, these three private companies have pushed their governments talk about democracy, to get the United States and Britain to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars contract to supply Australia. Australia is a signatory of the Treaty of Rarotonga, which is the South Pacific nuclear free zone, guys. Just keep that in mind. Violating all its treaties, Australia is going to have nuclear powered submarines. And the United States has said, well, it's not nuclear weapons on the submarine, just nuclear power. Uh, good luck with that, because these subs will have the capacity to carry nuclear weapons. And once that horse bolts from the yard, you know that there's a rider going to get on it and he's carrying a nuclear weapon. So be careful what they say. They say, no, no, this is just nuclear powered. These are nuclear powered submarines that are capable of carrying nuclear Tomahawk missiles. That's where they have gone. In the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you another story, which is that people in Eurasia haven't been sitting around and letting this go by without, uh, you know, the possibility of another history. Uh, Russia and China, which have had a long dispute um, that goes back to pre prior to the communist revolutions in both the Tsarist Empire and in uh, the Republican Empire in China, these predate these issues, these border issues are very old. In the midst of being squeezed by the United States, both the Russians and the Chinese, this has brought Russia and China closer together. So much so that they basically settled their border dispute. I mean, what a miracle. They settled a contentious border dispute. They conducted in 2001 a good neighborly treaty. They re-upped um, that treaty this year, and it's a much deeper treaty. Putin says we don't want a military alliance with the Chinese, but effectively, friends, the, the way that the Chinese and, and, and Russian militaries have been training together, it's effectively a military alliance. So if the United States thinks they can go to war against China, they're going to have to contend with the fact that the Russians will need to get involved. But also politically, just this month, the Iranians joined the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, the SCO, which includes China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, India, Pakistan, Iran. Two thirds of the world's uh, inhabited landmass belong to the SCO. It's not a marginal body. And 40% of the world's population is now in the SCO. The SCO is decidedly against the US pressure campaign on Asia. So now if this SCO is going to move towards some kind of strategic alliance, the United States is essentially putting itself at war against Asia. That's what's happening, friends. This is not just a US pressure campaign on China. This is going to escalate into the United States putting pressure on Asia. 
And I'm telling you something, these Asian countries, Iran, Russia, China, and so on, they're not going to take this lying down. This is a very dangerous situation. You need to campaign to dial back the kind of warmongering coming from Washington, D.C. Whatever you think about these countries in Asia, you have to dial back this down. It's not Russia or China, or Iran or Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan that's provoking us to war. It's the United States of government. It's your government. You have to do something. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Prashad. Uh, so let's introduce our, our next speaker. So Tings Chak is a Shanghai-based researcher and coordinator of the art department of Tricontinental, the Institute for Social Research, uh, who recently led the study um, called Serve the People, the Eradication of Extreme Poverty in China. She's also a founding member of Dongsheng News, an international collective of researchers interested in Chinese politics and society. I'll give the floor to uh, Tings Chak. Thank you very much, Ron, and thank you to the DSA's International Committee for hosting this event. I, like VJ, want to congratulate you for this important um, uh, initiative. Um, and so I was asked to talk a little bit about one of the questions was, why is the US targeting China now? And what does an alternative look like? And I know VJ has brought a great historical and geopolitical context, and Richard will no doubt go into the economics. So I want to bring a, a more of a social lens, particularly around the question of what China is actually doing for, for its people, its poor. And a few months ago, I had a chance to speak with a US filmmaker, Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and he made a great documentary on uh, China's poverty alleviation program. Uh, and it, it was a joint endeavor between two public broadcasters, the PBS and the CGTN. Um, but the documentary was actually taken off air last May. It was effectively censored. Um, and Robert told me that out of the 4,000 programs he's made for the PBS, this is this one on China's poverty alleviation program was censored, was the only one. So it makes me think, why is a story about China's you know, eradication of extreme poverty, a story needs to be censored. And why would the success of China in, in terms of what it's done for its people be disorienting for the US? Why is it seen as a threat? So this was um, the focus of what I'll talk about today is this poverty campaign. So it kind of helps dispel perhaps some of the myths or misunderstandings about it. But um, what comes in behind the study that we came out with, with Tricontinental that was already in the introduction. So I'll just start with some basic facts and then go into a little bit about how it was done and, and then open up to thinking about what this means for the rest of the world. Um, so on February 25th of this year, China announced that it had eradicated extreme poverty for 1.4 billion people. Um, just to put it into historical context, that since the opening up reform period, that, that is the last 40 years, China has lifted 850 million people out of poverty. That's the population of Latin America, Caribbean, and most of the United States. And in this process, China contributed to 76% of the global reduction of poverty. But when you look at our current conjuncture, the economic crises that pre-existed that were deepened during the pandemic have actually seen an increase in global poverty for the first time since 1998. And of course, we've also seen this in the US, rates of poverty, unemployment, hunger. Um, and it's actually estimated that by 2030, rather than eliminating world poverty as per the UN SDG goals, um, there will be over 1 billion people living in extreme poverty. So combating poverty is an urgent question of our times. It comes back to think, why should a story about how China is approaching one of these urgent questions of our time be seen as a threat or necessarily censored? So for this study, we, we looked at the literature, we talked to experts, we did our field research or went to the countryside. We met with party cadres, peasants, women, elders. And I'll bring a couple of those stories along, but there's more in the study itself. Um, I just want to summarize as a key takeaways from what we understood from the program. First of all, is that it is a historical process, a multi-generational process in the transition towards socialism that began 1949, where 
the question of poverty and question of hunger has always been central. Remembering that when the PRC was found in 1949, it emerged as a war-torn, desperately poor, uh, after a century of humiliation under imperialist powers. So whether it's the land reform or social gains under the Mao Zedong period, or which forms the basis for the economic and reform period under Deng Xiaoping, um, this is the kind of backbone that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty through mass economic um, uh, transformation and the development of productive forces quite quickly. That is what we lead to in this period under Xi Jinping, which I'll focus more on. So that is just the historical take. The other uh, five points is that China relied on a holistic or multidimensional approach to poverty reduction. Uh, it wasn't a cash transfer or welfare-based um, uh, project. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, the third point is that uh, this campaign relied on the base building work of the party at the grassroots level in the countryside. Um, the fourth is about the capacity of the government to actually mobilize uh, all sectors of society, uh, private, public, and the civil sectors together. Um, the fifth is that we can't, um, uh, un we can't stress enough the role of the poor peasants themselves in participating in the lifting of themselves out of poverty or in some ways as being protagonists in the process. Uh, and finally, understanding that the elimination of poverty, extreme poverty is not an end goal in itself. It's a stage in this construction um, of a social society. And, and ultimately we know that poverty is very much an issue of class as well. So it comes to then uh, in 2013, when President Xi uh, assumes power, uh, he visits a small village in Hunan province and he, he says in, in reflecting on poverty that you can't use a grenade to blast a flea. And, and what he was saying was that um, the economic development uh, that was able to uplift the, mass, the masses out of extreme poverty weren't able to reach some of those most difficult pockets of poverty where people were living in extremely remote areas or ecologically uh, damaged or ecologically um, um, uh, sort of yeah, areas that are, are dangerous to live in. Um, and that in order to emerge out of poverty, there needed to be a program called targeted poverty alleviation to go in and zero in on where the poverty is. And the program has kind of has one slogan because a lot of Chinese policy follows slogans is the one income, two assurances and three guarantees. The first of income, of course, is the uh, essential aspect. You have to be able to have a poverty line that in China actually is, is a little bit higher than the World Bank international standard. Um, but probably more important to than, uh, than to income is the five other indicators. That's the two assurances of food and clothing. You don't have to worry about food and clothing. The three uh, guarantees of uh, access to basic medical services, to free and compulsory education, which in China is nine years, and uh, access to safe housing with drinking water and electricity. So it's this together that define what was the, the metrics of the targeted program. But of course, China is a huge country. It's 1.4 billion people. How do you know who the poor are, where they are? Uh, you can't rely on statistics. You actually have to go to the people to actually understand the conditions, the needs, uh, and then create plans so that each person can emerge out of extreme poverty. And, and this is really relying on the strength of the party itself, um, remembering that the, the CPC is a, an enormous organization of 95 million members with 5 million organizations at every level of social life. So in 2014, at the beginning of the program, 800,000 party members were sent um, to the countryside to begin knocking on doors, to begin, begin serving income sources, education, housing conditions, health conditions. And this was put into a national database of 100 million people registered into the program. But I also want to stress it's not just officials going to the countryside and deciding whether someone is poor or not. There's a whole sort of democratic um, uh, process at the grassroots level that happens. And this is actually what was featured in, in Robert's film, these democratic appraisal meetings where the whole villagers come together and have to debate about each family's status. Uh, should they be listed as poor? Uh, have they recovered from poverty? Have they fallen back into poverty? Is someone not reporting the three goats that they actually had in, as part of their you know, income sources, et cetera? And, and beyond just identification of 
who the poor are, three million cadres were actually sent to live in the villages. Uh, one cadre per family was assigned, and then there was local teams that were formed for every village. And, and it's impressive. They lived there for two to four years at a time uh, and, and made, ensuring that every one of these families came out of poverty and developing the plans for each one of these families. And we got to, in this, doing the study, go around and, talk, and just see what the work looks like on a day-to-day -day level. So it's, it's really just some, you're, you're on your cell phone the whole, to, whole time. There's a Mr. John calling you saying, oh, uh, can you come over? My front door lock is broken. I need you to help me to fix it. Or it's Mrs. Wong's son is not going to school. Can you come talk to him, counsel him, you know, tell him how important it is to go to school. My auntie is sick. Can you help me figure out how to get her health care, et cetera. The basics. Uh, basic material necessities being met um, uh, by these daily, daily grassroots type of work. And, and beyond just mobilizing the party itself and, and uh, kind of the, the kind of public will is really how to create a, a broad mobilization of different sectors of society. Um, and, you know, it, we're talking about uh, private enterprises linked to villages or student and academic, academic groups linked to villages. We have national training programs, I'll give you one example, that were created for teachers and doctors so that in exchange for free education, they would need to work in the poor and ethnic minority areas for some time. So under these schemes, 17 million rural teachers were trained and 190,000 of them were dispatched to the countryside to live and work in these um, uh, poor villages. And the five really uh, key methodologies um, that we that the, the government employed in this program is primarily through industry. Uh, developing productive ca capacity is key. You have to, uh, you, whether it's agricultural co uh, cooperatives, whether it's small scale factories, whether it's connecting the countryside to urban markets, that's the key part uh, and to increase the incomes uh, of, of the people in the countryside. You have education, which has always been central. Uh, improving existing schools, building new schools, but also ensuring that people from poor families and from rural families get to access higher education. So in the last 10 years, 70% of people in universities uh, were the first in their family to ever attend university. And 70% of those were coming from the countryside. You have also what's called ecological compensation, recognizing that uh, the period of rapid development came at huge cost to the environment. And there's been big projects around uh, environmental restoration, uh, tree planting, afforestation. And so hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created in link linking to the work of ecological restoration. You have social assistance, which of course applies for people who aren't, aren't able to work, people with disabilities, the elderly, that is a core component as well. And finally, for the most extreme, like I had mentioned earlier, is uh, that in some uh, small cases, about 10% of the cases, some people had to be moved to a habitable environment. So new communities that were built. And with my last two minutes, I just wanted to uh, uh, spend a, tell a little story about someone that I met. Her name is He Ying. And like many poor peasant women, she used to work as a migrant worker in a more wealthier province when her first son was born which means that she actually had to leave her son behind in the village in the care of her parents. And she could only come home once a year to, to visit them. So when she was pregnant with her second son, she actually chose to enter the government's poverty alleviation program and because she wanted to relocate to a new community where the family could be together, even though her own family opposed because they didn't know what that would entail. And we walked with her in her, the community she lives in now. Uh, she wakes up at 7.30, uh, drops off her kid at school. What a two hour walk each way uh, that used to take two hours each way now takes five minutes. She now lives in a community where there are three childcare facilities. There's a middle school, there's a high school, there's three health clinics. Um, her Ying's family of 10 that used to live in a very small wooden house now live in three spacious apartments that have been through subsidies, uh, given new furniture, you know, ready to live in condition, let's say. Um, but of course the transition from the peasant way of life to the urban one is not an easy one. Um, even you know, her own husband felt threatened by her newfound sort of confidence. Her mother and in-laws were not supportive. So you imagine 
that it makes sense the hesitance of especially the elders that have never actually lived left the village and have never been to the city have never seen a traffic light so what are kinds of ways that you can uh, walk alongside them so that this transition is made easier they have a program called for example six firsts where you get often high school students um, uh, to to walk with people to go on their first uh, how to cross the street for the first time how to go to the shop to buy some things uh, how to ride an elevator. So I think this is symbolic of some of the process of how people are have to be convinced um, and also the continued of daily work of ensuring that people adapt, find work, remain out of poverty and, and really build their confidence. And, and her Yang's example, I think is very um, touching and inspiring because in the process of her coming out of poverty, she actually becomes a leader in the party, joins the party, is a leader of the Women's Federation and is one of the 12 people that live in the community to take care of the 18,000 people that live there in these daily life ways. And I know my time is up. Um, and I just wanted to end on one, one, one note is that, um, you know, there are two big uh, uh, successes that the last year had in China. One is combating extreme poverty. And the other is also uh, very relatively quickly overcoming the pandemic. Um, remembering that, for example, the pandemic took 4,600 4, Chinese lives. In comparison, in the US, I was 674,000 deaths. That means more people died on one single day in the US than the entire pandemic killed in China. So between the pandemic and, 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 this, um, uh, and the poverty campaign, I just wanted to share also, it's not surprising how much the public opinion here uh, supports its government and actually supports and, and sees the, the real gains that have been done for the people, especially for the poor. Um, and I, I want to just, this study is a, one of the ways to help bring a story that's rarely told, told about and pretty much silence in the West. Uh, so helps us understand for those of us who are interested in really the human question of poverty um, and understand that, um, that to have a home, to have access to education, to have access to healthcare, these are all um, aspirations shared by uh, the poor and the working classes of the world. So with that, thank you. Sorry for going over time a bit. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks. Uh, that was a uh, very thorough explanation, much appreciated. Uh, but before we introduce the next speaker, I do just wanna again briefly remind everyone that if anyone has any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function to submit questions. Uh, Next, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Richard Wolf, who is the Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a visiting professor in the Graduate Program in International Affairs of the New School University in New York City. He's the founder of Democracy at Work and host of their nationally syndicated show, Economic Update. His latest book is The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself which can be found along with his other books, Understanding Socialism and Understanding Marxism at democracyatwork.info. And on that note, uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, take it away. Okay, I can save time uh, not repeating the thanks to the DSA and your committee for organizing this. I know the work that goes into this. I appreciate it enormously. Uh, as I do, I might like to say, uh, I do am amazing is my reaction to the development and growth of the DSA. It augurs well for changes here in the United States, which it both reflects and advances. So it is a, it's an honor for me to be involved in uh, your work. Uh, and thank you therefore for the invitation. I'm gonna talk about three or four dimensions of the economic dimensions of the Cold War uh, against China. I think that you'll see clear overlaps and cross fertilizations uh, between what I said and what the previous, both of the previous speakers uh, have said. And I want to stress that there's no particular order or ranking to these four, uh, which of them you think is more or less important is something I hope you will spend some time, each of you, doing on your own, in your own thinking and your own research. Okay, so let's begin. Um, 
Cold War is the right, the right phrase because we've already had a Cold War. We had one after World War II uh, with the Soviet Union. As you all know, that's where the name uh, basically comes from. Uh, when that one was over, we quickly uh, transitioned to the war against terrorism. Uh, when that was beginning to get fuzzy, we had a big war against Afghanistan and Iraq, um, carefully chosen that we would confront with the largest and biggest military in the world. Two countries are clearly at the other end of the spectrum of wealth and military preparedness. Uh, in a Christian country, the image of David and Goliath might come to mind, and I'll leave it to you to figure out who plays which role. Having an, an adversary, having a Cold War has been very, very important. It would have been very difficult at the end of World War II to maintain the level of military spending that this country was able to maintain if there hadn't been a very scary threat conjured up. Because VJ is a historian, I won't dare go into that area very much. Let me just say that I'm sure most of you know that shortly after the Russian Revolution, four countries invaded with their military, the new Soviet Republic. One of them was the United States. Uh, it therefore is a historical fact that the United States invaded the Soviet Union, but the reverse never happened. And therefore, who should be afraid of whom? Well, you can draw your own conclusions. It is very important to have a frightening, scary, evil adversary. It is very hard to justify the kind of military spending that this country engages in. As VJ pointed out, this country spends money on the military, maintains hundreds of bases, maintains an active military invention on a global interventions on a global scale. That's very expensive. In order to put the money there, you have to have political support for doing so. And while there are many ways to generate that support, one of them is to have a very frightening, very evil, terrible threat at all times, punctuated by little skirmishes just to drive the point home. It justifies not only military spending, but the other side of that, cutting back on other kinds of spending, lest you overdo it and borrow too much money or have some other economic downturn or negative that you can't really afford. It also justifies the very act that brought this seminar webinar into being, namely yet another way to subsidize American corporations, this time in the name of competing with the People's Republic of China. So it is a budget driven maneuver that should never be forgotten. It is, in my judgment, as important a cause of the Cold War against China as anything else. Second point, it is important as part of what I just said to demonize success when that success is happening in China. Hence, I'm not surprised to learn that NPR censored that documentary film. Of course it did. But as an economist, I am in the strange position of having to tell people who would otherwise know such things that over the last 25 years, on average, the GDP of the People's Republic of China grew roughly three times faster than the GDP of the United States. I want to let that sink in. There is no contest for quarter of a century. Whatever it is the People's Republic of China is doing, 
with its own state-owned enterprises, with the private capitalist Chinese enterprises, with the private foreign non-Chinese enterprises, whatever it is doing is an extraordinary success by the standards developed in the West. Whatever else, whatever other standards you might want to mention. This has to be dealt with. If anything, even more important is the fact that over the same period of time, the real wages in China have quadrupled and the real wages of the United States have stagnated, have gone virtually nowhere. This is an, uh, you're not even close here. You're, you're dealing with staggering differentials that are fundamental to any economic analysis that I'm familiar with east, west, or anywhere else. Now, I think it's important just to mention when, and it's rare, that these numbers are admitted and confronted, a whole series of ad hoc comments are made by economists seeking to downplay, to erase, and to marginalize these staggering differences in economic performance. For example, and I only have time for one. Well, this isn't all that impressive because China starts from a very low level and you can have an increase more quickly uh, from a low level than you can have an increase from a high level. Uh, this, is, this is silly arithmetic used for ideological purposes. The vast majority of the people of the world are at the low level and they've been trying desperately for the last century to move up and they haven't been able to do it. What's remarkable about China is that it did do it, whereas the others didn't do it, which suggests an extraordinary, exceptional quality. And when you remember that the foreign aid that was doled out by Western countries to most of the other countries trying to do what the Chinese haven't, and it was not given to the Chinese because they were run by the Communist Party, it only makes their achievement even more impressive. This is a serious problem, and this serious problem has to be demonized. If I had more time, I would give you the parallel the economic growth achieved by the Soviet Union, particularly after the middle to late 1920s, also had to be demonized because it was too quick, because it was too impressive, because like the Chinese, it outperformed the West. Third point, and I'm going out on a limb by this, the Chinese have chosen, as best I can tell, not to compete with the United States militarily. Time will tell us whether this was a smart move or it wasn't. I hate to think what would have to happen if it was not a smart move, but VJ is scaring us as it is. I won't add to that. But here is what I think China has decided to do. And I mean this in all seriousness. It is going to compete where its strength lies. It's not in the military. What it is, is in the following. Eradicating poverty, decreasing as a matter of policy, the level of inequality inside China, which the Common Prosperity and other programs, uh, including going after the tech giants, taking away wealth from the profit category and moving it into the wage category. These are extraordinary steps. If they are part of a general program, then I would argue we may be witnessing one of the greatest innovations in great power competition the world has ever seen. It will be the deliberate pursuit of what the United States did in the 20th century, 
namely become a higher standard of living, a, a greater degree of equality, because remember, before the 1970s, the United States was a less unequal country uh, than the rest of Europe. Now we are more. But before, the United States was a rising standard of living and a relatively less unequal society. And that gave it enormous competitive advantages. I think the Chinese are deliberately doing the same thing and will surprise the United States, especially, and here's my response to what the DSA asked me to talk about, if organizations like the DSA can do something systematic to undo the demonization, to provide the information in the way that the Tri-Continental is doing with its documents, uh, and in the way that, that you were speaking a minute ago, things in, in your conversation, to, to do something to make it clear what is going on there to juxtapose to the worsening inequality here, to the reduction uh, of public supports, and there I would echo, I'm not gonna repeat it, but in the United States, we have four and a half percent of the world's population, and we account for 20% of the world's deaths from COVID. It's another way of the same statistic we heard a few minutes ago, but it should drive home when the rich, one of the richest countries in the world with one of the most developed medical systems has to face a reality summarized by that statistic, you are watching something going on. My last point, I'll take, I'll go even further out on a limb. The accumulation of evidence, whether it be in the response to COVID, whether it be in the unspeakable level of inequality, whether it be in the vision of the vigilantes that uh, we saw at the border against the, the, the poverty-stricken Haitians, whether we see it in a population so distressed that it will vote not to wear masks and vote not to vaccinate itself, doing here in the United States the same kind of self-destructive rage behavior that the British working class that voted for Brexit did to itself. We are watching a system, in my judgment, that has peaked and is in decline. And empires in decline overreach themselves, try to do things they can't afford to do, provoke the people in power to use their power and position to offload the costs of social decline onto those beneath them in the social hierarchy. The British Empire is an example over the whole last century, writing the final chapters of that decline in the sad way we can now observe. Last and final point. The issue of whether there'll be a Cold War in China beyond what we've seen is not a settled matter. It is a consensus, quite right, among Republicans and Democrats. It was pushed by Obama because he knew the Republicans wouldn't oppose it. It was pushed by Trump for the exact same reason in reverse. It was politically advantageous. But that policy has been systematically opposed by the US Chamber of Commerce, by the business and industry associations pretty much across the board. There are some important exceptions, but the business community has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in China, hundreds of billions of dollars in investments linked to not a war and not a cold war either. They are fighting, they are angry, and whether or not you want to bet on the political hacks or you want to bet on those businesses, I think it's a very open question. And in any case, the bigger problem is the decline of the American dominance 
and the decline of the American system. That will have more to do with policy towards China than the other way around. Thank you for your time. And I hope that that was of some interest. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that analysis, uh, Dr. Wolf. Uh, so moving on to the uh, next item on the agenda, uh, we are going to have a, a presentation um, uh, showing the highlights from the US Innovation and Competition Act, uh, which is a piece of legislation uh, that uses industrial policy and other elements in order to counter China as part of a new Cold War. We are going to have Grayson, a member of DSA International Committee and co-chair of Orlando DSA, who uh, will give the presentation on the highlights of the legislation. Grayson, uh, take it away. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you to all of our speaker, our panelists tonight. I am, I know I am the, uh, I'm the, I'm not the most interesting uh, of everyone on here tonight, but we'll be talking about some of the interesting things that are going on um, with this, um, with this bill, and it was has really spurred on um, the international committee and you know DSA to uh, publicly state our opposition to. Um, the imperialist tensions that the United States is, is uh, creating. And so the USICA, the U US Innovation and Competition Act is a massive, massive bill. Uh, it is a bill that is, uh, is described as industrial policy. Um, there was some acclaim and, and excitement um, initially by uh, even progress, you know, progressive uh, groups and, and, and forces throughout the country because the United States hasn't really had an industrial policy um, since like the 60s and 70s. Um, but similar to our previous industrial policy, there's, there's a very, 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 very big catch. Um, and that catch is, is that this is a um, global industrial diplomatic military policy that's aimed very explicitly to reinforce imperialist interest uh, for the United States across the world. Like it, it says, it, it might as well say so. Um, it, it really does in large parts of it. Um, it's very explicitly targeting uh, uh, China and aims to uh, kneecap China in any way possible uh, to rile up global conflict, to undermine um, China uh, domestically and Chinese uh, economic relations and uh, throughout the world. Um, and it's also meant to reinforce, expand and increase uh, existing imperial networks that the United States has throughout the world, uh, be it in Latin America, be it in Africa, be it in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, Europe and North America, right? Like we even, they talk about Canada <laughs> in there and how we can use Canada to oppose China. Uh, it gets pretty deep. Antarctica is in there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty in depth. Um, so some of the most significant aspects of it, it calls for significant military budget increases, uh, escalating militarization in the Indo-Pacific re uh, uh, region, and bureaucratizing anti-China federal policy, uh, creating uh, institutions within the United States federal government uh, that will permanently that exists explicitly to oppose China. Um, it includes two acts. Uh, one is the Endless Frontier Act, which is predominantly focused around technology, specifically chip manufacturing, and would actually uh, allocate about 70 billion, if I'm remembering the number off the top of my head correctly, um, of defense spending uh, to chip manufacturing uh, domestically. And the Strategic Competition Act, which is literally competition against China. Uh, that's, that's every, the Strategic Competition Act is just the Imperialism <laughs> Act. Uh, and uh, this bill has passed already in the Senate, uh, bipartisan. Uh, the only person in the Democratic caucus that voted against it was the wonderful Bernie Sanders. Um, and so this is something that has widespread bipartisan support as our panelists have made very clear. Uh, and it, it makes only more clear and evident why uh, the left in the United States, in particular DSA, uh, has to take a stand um, and start actually like litigating this and and showing why this is bad for the world, and why it's also bad for uh, for American workers too. Um, this is bad for everybody unless you are 
you know, part of the imperial elite classes, uh, capitalist classes in, in the United States. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Um, so the USICA appropriates uh, $650 million per year for the next four years from 2022 to 2026 uh, for military spending in the Indo-Pacific region. And that's, ju that's just uh, military spending for the United States. That's not including additional spending um, for on behalf of other uh, state militaries uh, that we support in the region. Uh, there is a pilot program that's being that's discussed within the bill, talking about uh, a program for foreign military financing. It's kind of what I referenced there. I think it was something like $100 million to kick it off, uh, basically just like a slush fund to pay out uh, for you know, uh, uh, arms manufacturing, defense spending in countries that are um, uh, you know, under our influence. Increasing Japan and Taiwan's military capacity, kind of obvious why we would do that. Those are our, the main, uh, main actors that carry out US uh, policy in the region, the most reliable actors for that, and also the most under US control. Um, transfer of excess US military equipment, um, you know, again, that's a very aggressive uh, action to take. I think there is a parallel that we could make to the programs where we do see that domestically and how that's kind of heightened the power and violence of, the, of America's domestic police forces. So um, it, kind of the same intention with doing this with foreign uh, police and military forces by sending our military assets to them. Um, and then it very clearly and blatantly has undermined most recently with the the uh, nuclear submarine deal uh, undermining uh, nuclear arms control um, and upgrading U.S. nuclear capacity. Um, and so by and large, for the, just the Indo-Pacific region, right, like there's significant investments in uh, expanded militarization, but it's not just in this region, right? Like there is uh, in the Strategic Competition Act to mitigate Chinese, you know, supposed Chinese influence in Latin America, there's uh, something like $100 million that would go to uh, to mil existing military programs, right, like all re that we have where we train, um, you know, uh, Latin American militaries, like the Colombian military, which is notorious for being extremely violent, um, and kind of expanding that. And so this bill is pretty explicitly, um, especially on the military front, about pressuring China um, in, in a show of force. Right. Uh, there's discussions before about the military drills, the kind of the, the um, you know, uh, ships kind of coming up against the borders. Um, and this would really only embolden that, enhance that. The, the most recent deal with Australia is pretty explicitly. I mean, it is. I mean, President Biden came out and explicitly said this is to counter Chinese influence. Right. Like they're telling us what this is for. It's not a this isn't like a secret. Um, it's explicitly to oppose China and, and threaten China. Um, next slide. So one of the most interesting parts of this, uh, and you know, personally as someone who was participating in the research for this bill and for this kind of uh, like what we've been doing here, what really took me by surprise was just how explicit that the uh, USICA was on propaganda, right? Like very explicitly, uh, not, not necessarily using like front organizations like Voice of America, though it does discuss that in there, but like very explicitly, like, we are going to fund the, we're gonna, going to fund uh, journalists, uh, media channels, social media, uh, whatever we can to explicitly propagate anti-Chinese um, messaging uh, across the world, right? Not in, just in the Indo-Pacific region, but um, there's a provision explicitly creating a program where Latin American journalists would be trained by the United States on how to expose China. Like it, it literally, I'm almost saying verbatim what this bill says, right? Like this is, it's, you know, it's shocking things to read um, how explicit they are with what they want to accomplish. There's no smoke and mirrors here or, or hiding behind the intentions. Um, so $300 million a year uh, towards establishing a countering Chinese influence fund which is a, which again, another slush fund, another general fund 
that would go towards uh, intelligence agencies, um, American academia, um, just kind of permeate uh, uh, American media in general, um, but also international media to propagate uh, images, uh, you know, negative images of China. I mean, again, uh, as uh, Dr. Wolf was saying, uh, make China the big baddie uh, to kind of justify all the spending. And then also when we say bureaucratize anti-China federal policy, every single provision within the US uh, ICA very explicitly creates a, a, a new layer of bureaucracy in, almost, in, in so many of the committee, existing committees that are explicitly uh, creating reports and report backs and, and planning and development on anti-Chinese uh, campaigns it, it permanently, right? Like with no, no end in sight. It, uh, a lot of the provisions, it says within 90 days of this bill being uh, signed into law, these report backs, federal, like the, this new federal bureaucracy, this new layer of uh, bureaucracy will be created. And one of the reasons that that's so dangerous is that it creates a, within the federal government, it creates a uh, permanent, uh, a permanent part of our government that has no reason because all of its money comes from antagonizing China from, you know, if your money is coming from something, you want more of it. And so uh, there's a whole new layer of federal bureaucracy that is explicitly about antagonizing and, and opposing and undermining and attacking China in any way possible. And so by creating this kind of federal, uh, permanent federal bureaucracy, um, you kind of enshrine within the United States for good, right? Un unless it's dismantled, which is incredibly difficult, um, a, extremely hostile foreign policy towards China. Um, and I see, this is something that we see with Cuba, with uh, how there's very explicit and permanent provisions within the federal government to uh, attack and sanction Cuba in, in, in any way possible. And I think we all uh, within DSA and, and, and broadly and Americans are starting to recognize the, the violence and the, the unnecessary nature of this, but it's incredibly difficult to even peel back because it's, it's just built in, right? Like there's a lot of money that people make off of uh, within the government and, and contractors uh, to the government. And so that's what this would create. Uh, over $450 million a year, increasing broadcasting funding of US-centric media, such as Radio Free Asia. Obviously these are propaganda outlets um, that are already existing, but, and you know, these imperial networks already exist, but only expand them and, and, uh, and make more explicit what they're doing. Um, establishing anti-China federal bureaucracy to conduct witch hunts of undue Chinese influence in the United States. Uh, this is predominantly intelligence and academic base. Uh, and this is something that's already started, right? We're, we're already seeing this. There are already provisions in, uh, the, in like a, a lot of states and, and federally where um, you know, there has to be like significant, like very, like much more like borderline harassment of Chinese uh, students coming into the United States, uh, like back on their background checks and, you know, very explicit. And so this would ramp that up significantly. It would ban U.S. academics from receiving any funding uh, in any way or any grant that's in any way could or could be proven to have been in some way, somehow, some fashion funded by a Communist Party of China member. Um, you know, that, that would be grounds of, of uh, that would actually be illegal, right? And so uh, there's, a, there's almost 100 million members of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, it's a pretty big net uh, that's being cast here. Um, codifies Chinese involvement in international infrastructure projects as a threat to U.S. interests. Uh, it very explicitly, again, very explicitly, this bill says um, it will be like, we will, we, call for opposing uh, Chinese influence in the WHO, the WTO, you name an international organization that is ostensibly, you know, oh, if you're part of the liberal international order, you're supposed to be in this. Uh, it would, like the United States, it would, be, it would be codified in law that the United States would oppose Chinese, Chinese presence in any international, any significant international forum that exists. Um, it's pretty dream stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so diplomatic and economic coercion, uh, again, this bill gets really, it gets really into it. Uh, it calls for a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, 
over $80 billion in four years to be raised for capital uh, in the International American Development Bank to restructure Latin American debt um, to stipulate against further engagement with Chinese investment. Um, there would be a mandated comptroller report uh, every 90 days on U.S. sister city participants. Um, if, if you have a, city, a sister city with China, uh, your, your city is now under surveillance by the U.S. federal government. Uh, undermines the foreign domestic policy of uh, countries engaging with China in infrastructure projects, uh, expands U.S. relations with Taiwan uh, in that it would call for China, uh, for Taiwan having representation on international bodies, which is something that's been long agreed upon not to be done between the United States and China, but this explicitly revokes that. And so, yeah, it, this is, uh, the, uh, the USICA is extremely explicit in what it wants to do. It, 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 this, is, it, this is for uh, imperialism. This is to, uh, to undercut China, China in any way possible. Uh, it's not about any existing threat to the U.S. or like to the United States itself, but it's about not allowing China to uh, exercise any sort of influence domestically or with neighbors and in, in internationally. It's meant to completely cut it off from the international uh, order, from the rest of the world. Uh, it says as much. It, that's that's what it's for. And obviously, this is horrific and evil for the rest of the world. And uh, and uh, uh, continuation of the massive infringement of sovereignty that the United States is uh, against the rest of the peoples of the world. Um, but also, I mean, this is a lot of money of American workers that's going towards this, right? Like you're, no American worker is gonna see any benefit uh, from this. Uh, Americans will also, you know, especially leftist, socialist, uh, TSA members, very much setting us up for, um, you know, uh, internal repression. Um, that's also, that's also explicitly made clear. So thank you for listening to my little more boring talk uh, about the USICA and we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Grayson. Uh, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation on the highlights of the USICA. Uh, so now let's move on to the panelists uh, Q&A session. Uh, again, I want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat to submit questions. Uh, all right, on that note, uh, let's move on to the questions. So the first question uh, that I have is, uh, well, what can, uh, well, there's a DSA International Committee event. Uh, so the question would be, uh, what can DSA and the US left do practically uh, to help build a movement against the Cold War with China? Uh, I will give the floor to uh, Vijay. Um, firstly, uh, thanks a lot to Grayson. That's it's really important to look so closely at these, um, you know, bills that go before the U.S. Congress, educate people, and exercise some modicum of democracy. I think it's something that's often forgotten. I, I'm. I think it's there's nothing boring about a presentation like that. And there's everything to be seized on and, and to drive. You don't let them get away with it, guys. That's the main thing. Um, I think Richard made a very important point about you know education and going out there and campaigning uh, to essentially enlighten people about you know the kind of things that things was talking about. You know we need to stop the demonization of China. China has been demonized in the United States for 200 years. Um, let's not forget that there was the uh, ban on Asians, um, you know, to immigrate into into the United States from the 19th century till 1965, and that ban was secured uh, officially 1924. That ban was secured uh, with this strange idea that uh, the particularly Chinese labor, but others as well, would undercut U.S. labor, and you know. I mean, you know, there was a pamphlet written by Samuel Gompers called um, Meat Versus Rice, saying that American masculinity cannot be undermined by Chinese effeminacy. I mean, this racist, sexist discourse of the yellow peril is a very old one and has to be eradicated. And I think it can only be done by quite disciplined and, um, and, and systematic organizing and a campaign. Uh, we're not just talking about the possibility of of further conflict, war, and so on. But in fact, uh, the working class and, and, and working people in the United States are being undermined 
by the utilization of this racist kind of of of, uh, of rhetoric against china uh, you got to put that into into context doesn't help anybody in the united states to to spend trillions of dollars um you know in a conflict against china the us spent and and i'm going to put this to you and i hope you'll use this to campaign on us spent over 2 trillion dollars in this ridiculous occupation in afghanistan where none of its war aims were attained when the us left afghanistan in humiliation in august of 2021 three quarters of afghan people did not have electricity three quarters of afghan people did not have electricity i mean you know what a waste of money what a waste of social wealth what a waste of the surplus um, what was it used for you know it was used for fraud it was used for corruption um, it was used to buy weapon systems the swedes entered this conflict in Afghanistan to test their weapon systems. Uh, that came out through a WikiLeaks um, you know, release of Swedish government documents, which showed they were discussing, should we go into the NATO conflict? Because, yeah, let's go and test our weapon systems. It's that level of cynicism. We got a campaign to people about it. It doesn't help their bread and butter issues. The decline of standards in the United States is not going to be improved. Um, by the ratcheting up of rhetoric, racist rhetoric against the Chinese, the inability to learn from China on the issue of poverty eradication and how to tackle COVID. Um, the, uh, sec the Secretary General of the World Health Organization, a distinguished African scientist, Dr. Ted Ross, has said from the beginning, no, not stigma, but collaboration, listening to each other, learning together, you know, where are these values? Um, and, and I'm not surprised that Mr. Biden is accelerating uh, the Trump and Obama behavior against China. I'm not surprised. Um, you know, Mr. Biden had as his secretary of state a French speaking diplomat, Antony Blinken. Uh, Antony Blinken went to France on the 25th of June of this year. He met the French foreign minister, Mr. Lee Dane, uh, met Emmanuel Macron. They told him, look, the sale of the submarines to Australia is fundamental to the French economy. Uh, Lee Dane's tried to say that it's not actually a French project of submarines. It's a U.S. French partnership because Lockheed Martin is part of this $90 billion deal. And the United States, meanwhile, was negotiating behind the French back uh, to change the Australian buy order to buy these nuclear powered submarines. And that's the character of this government, guys. You know, that's the character of this government. Uh, they don't really care about the life uh, of people in the United States. That's not on the forefront of their of their of their thinking. They're thinking about profits for big business, for military contractors and so on. You want to campaign on this campaign on life. Don't campaign on death. The D it is actually incumbent on the DSA to campaign on life and not death. It's not about what you think of the Communist Party in China. It's not about what you think of Xi Jinping. None of those things are germane to this, you know. None of these things are germane. Uh, the last point I want to make, make is today, or maybe yesterday, in the Australian, the head of Australia's Defense Intelligence Agency, the head of the agency wrote openly in the Australian leading newspaper in Australia calling for, and I kid you not guys, he openly calls for a coup inside the Communist Party to eject Xi Jinping, essentially regime change. This is the head of Australia's intelligence agency openly writes an op-ed in the Australian calling for the, uh, these governments, uh, you know, to intervene and overthrow the government in China. I mean, this is what we're up against, okay? These people are not sensible people. The sensibleness of the DSA has to bring some compassion, some collaboration, not stigma, not arms dealers. Um, don't allow the arms dealers to drive the agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prashad. Uh, so let's move on to the uh, next question, which is uh, how does uh, US economic and military aggression towards China affect the Indo-Pacific region and other places around the world? And how can we uh, articulate an alternative to it? Uh, I, who wants to take it away? Well, I can start maybe with a couple of uh, uh, of suggestions. Um, 
while I agree with everything that's been said, let me try to come at it from a slightly different way. Now, the United States waged a bloody revolution against Britain to achieve its independence. The British couldn't understand what had happened. So they tried again in 1812 to provoke yet another war in the hopes that they could undo in 1812 their defeat in 1776. That failed too. And the British decided that they could not, they could not reverse what they had allowed against their better judgment to emerge as a powerful ex-colony. And over the next 150 years, 200 years, the British had to learn bitterly that they had made a mistake so that from being the master, they became the poodle, as they have remained the poodle to this day. And if there are degrees of poodleness, they're going deeper and deeper into it. The United States has a similar decision to make. It is a descending economic power. And the People's Republic of China is an ascending unit. That's what those numbers I quoted to you before, that's what they show us. Something has been learned in the People's Republic of China, a way of organizing, controlling, and directing both private capitalist and state enterprises in a complicated dance and interaction shaped and governed by a political authority, the state and the communist party. I'm not commenting on whether it's good or bad as we have been asked not to do, but when it comes to economic performance, they are outperforming consistently year in and year out. So the United States has a choice to make endless conflict which you may very well lose but if the way you lose is by the kinds of aggression that the bill we just went through demonstrates the cost of your loss will be much greater than what you might have been able to work out in a sharing of the situation a compromise. We, can, we will give up X, Y, and Z. You will give up Q, L, and P. And together we will be able to do something. Yeah, that is a difficult task. But the choice we face alternatively are the levels of conflict that others have spoken to, which in a nuclear age are kind of unthinkable. They, they lend themselves to crazy people making the kinds of comments that the lunatic in Australia allowed himself. And that is, of course, dangerous. But if the American people have asked, hey, uh, this is the situation. Climb down off of your rhetorical horse about China and think a little bit what risks you are taking with this aggressiveness, maybe. There were those inside the advising councils of Adolf Hitler who told him, you might better make an arrangement than keep invading because if we lose, oh boy, are we gonna lose. That's the problem for the United States. That's part of why you see this over-the-top aggressiveness. They too, and I speak not just as an analyst, but someone who went to these universities that these policymakers went to, I know them personally. 
They know what is happening. They do. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think where it leads, but they know. And that's a opening into which a DSA program that makes all this explicit can have an enormous influence. Don't be dissuaded by them dismissing you. You are talking precisely about what's agonizing them and that has enormous power. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wolf. Uh, our next question uh, is for uh, Ms. Chuck. Um, the one, two, three metric utilized by the uh, CPC is a unique way to approach poverty alleviation. Uh, could you provide an explanation for why they did not utilize the standard such as the World Bank daily income? Will this be another step in the- Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. I mean. I think an important thing um, to emphasize is that the welfare-based or the cash transfer-based um, mechanisms that many countries, including China, had tried were not able to address um, the systemic causes of um, poverty. That is why those metrics had to be beyond just uh, the income level of the World Bank. Of course, here it's, uh, it's equivalent uh, adjusted to PPP. It's $2.3 per day. The World Bank uses $1.90. But in reality, those who participate in the program uh, uh, achieved incomes on average much higher than that. But as I said, the most key was really looking at housing, education, healthcare, and the production of um, capacity to create jobs. In terms of the next step, I mean, extreme poverty is just really the first um, step in that in that um, process. Now it's really asking the question, which Richard Wolf had mentioned, questions of inequality, questions of um, what is called common prosperity right now. And so we have to see the, uh, the huge overhauls we're seeing in the big tech industry, uh, challenging monopolistic practices on private education, on housing speculation, and the distribution of wealth, which right now the government is revisiting tax structures and its social welfare systems, and also getting big billionaires and big capital to pay their dues. So this is part of the project now as a next step to build a common prosperous society that looks at what are called now these three mountains uh, that are facing uh, the majority of the people in China, which is housing, education, and healthcare. And I, I think on the next level too, on the countryside, there is now um, a project around rural revitalization. How do you actually modernize agricultural production? How do you um, secure uh, national food security, especially in various areas where uh, strategic areas like seed production, China still has a lot to, um, ha has a lot to advance in, knowing that it has about 8% of the world's uh, arable land, but about 30% of the world's population. Uh, this is mathematically a challenging question of, of uh, since the history of China. Um, and in addition to this was the rural question is, how do you bring back um, the, the resources and talents from the city centers back to the countryside is one of the big questions. A lot of people have left, studied in other places, started business in other places. How do you attract them back uh, uh, to, to uh, bring capital, bring their resources and bring their knowledge and expertise to help modernize the countryside? So these are the big sort of next steps after alleviating uh, extreme poverty. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tanks. Um, all right. So uh, in the, it's 9.28 PM uh, in Eastern time. So in the interest of time, uh, let's move on to some uh, calls to action and closing remarks. Uh, I want to thank uh, each and uh, all of the panelists here uh, for their presentation and uh, responses. Uh, we much appreciated uh, your commentary regarding uh, how we can uh, effectively oppose this uh, new Cold War and oppose uh, USICA as well. So thank you. So uh, let's move on to uh, action items. Uh, so I want to uh, officially announce the uh, launch of the our letter campaigns, uh, which I will post into the chat. Uh, so we have an open letter uh, that can be signed by uh, individuals or organizations um, which criticize the USICA. Uh, this will be uh, this uh, open letter uh, to the members of Congress. It passed the US Senate, but it has not passed the US House. Uh, so please sign on to publicly 
express your opposition to the US ICA and the new Cold War. Uh, additionally, uh, we also have another link, as you can see, uh, uh, dsaic.org slash write Congress US ICA, where, which you can fill out to send an automated email to your member of Congress uh, so that they know uh, they have constituents who are opposing this uh, escalation, this aggression, and this Cold War uh, push against uh, China. Uh, additionally, I also want to encourage everyone to uh, join DSA at dsausa.org slash join. Uh, there's uh, no better way to resist imperialism and to take down capitalism. There's no better way than organization and being part of a collective by using the power in numbers. And finally, once you join DSA, I encourage you to join the international committee at dsaic.org slash join uh, to take on some uh, concrete anti-imperialist work. Um, moving on to the next slide, I also want to give a shout out to the next uh, DSA international committee event. Uh, it is uh, DSA says, let Cuba live, ending the US blockade today. This will be on Thursday, September 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern time or 3 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, please uh, RSVP at dsaic.org uh, slash Cuba. Uh, and this will be a tremendous panel featuring uh, Gail Walker, uh, Manolo De Los Santos, uh, and Daniel Montero. And this will be moderated by Brendan James, the co-host of Blowback, uh, which uh, recently did a, se a series on US uh, history of aggression against uh, the nation of Cuba. Uh, again, uh, I highly encourage everyone to uh, attend this event uh, and also to sign the open letters uh, against uh, the US ICA and the Cold War against China. Uh, again, uh, to close it out, uh, thanks uh, to all of our panelists, uh, Vijay Prashad, Ting Shock, and Dr. Richard Wolf for your comments today uh, and uh, for uh, showing us uh, a concrete path towards uh, organizing against this Cold War. Uh, and to those uh, who want a recording of this, uh, we will compile it and put it up on YouTube so you can um, see uh, all of it there. Again, thanks to everyone and uh, have a good night.